Okay, then let me introduce our next speaker, which is Colin Williams from the USGS. And he will be talking about establishing a viable critical mineral stockpile for the United States economy. Thank you very much for presenting. Thank you. And um, uh, I usually put the USGS Mineral Resources Program website on my slide. I don't know, I edited it off, but uh, if you Google USGS Mineral Resources Program, you will connect to our website um, and there are links to the National Minerals Information Center, uh, which Nadal talked about, produces our mineral statistics, critical minerals list, um, our various uh, studies, the Earth Mapping Resources Initiative, et cetera. I, I would say that, um, like many websites, it's uh, you have to dive down a number of layers to get to some things, and we're in the process of re uh, structuring it so it's flatter and should be easier to get to data and the restructure should roll out within the next month, but it's it's still functional. Um, and uh, I can tell already from the uh, agenda and the talks we already have that I think what I'm going to be talking about will be a relatively easy sell here. Um, the bottom line being that I think when we talk about solving our challenge with critical mineral supply chains, with addressing questions like what do we have as a stockpile to be able to respond to various disruptions uh, that we think expansively and think about a broad diversity of, of sources of supply. And uh, you know, Nadal already touched on this, so I'll be really quick, but of course, um, the list of critical minerals that we put out as directed by Congress as the Energy Act of 2020 are essentially those, are those that are essential to the economic or national security of the United States, uh, the supply chain of which is vulnerable to disruption and serve an essential function, the absence of which would have significant consequences for the economic or national security. And um, you know, so of course, uh, a factor in this, and Nadal talked about these different factors, is of course our import reliance, but our import reliance is, is not the only factor. Um, and he showed a, a version of this, this slide um, because, of course, we import quite a lot of our uh, essential mineral commodities from friendly trading partners like Canada or Chile, Australia, et cetera. It's really a question of supply risk. But um, I'm showing this slide because there are a couple of, of things that have motivated me to think about this problem a little bit. And I want to note, as you've already seen from this slide, that uh, pretty much everything I'm building on here is work by all our colleagues at the USGS who are funded by the Mineral Resources Program and many of their collaborators, uh, is that while US import reliance has grown over time, it, it's never been zero. <laughs> and if you go back uh, in the past, there have been historically concerns about um, the reliability of the supply chains and circumstances in which even if we were importing from friendly countries, there was a potential of disruption. And in particular, I want to go back to the late 1930s when um, the uh, U.S. Geological Survey and the U.S. Bureau of Mines collaborated on this report of certain deficient strategic minerals. And in particular, the government at that time, understandably, was concerned that there was potential for another world war. And whether or not the United States would be in that war, um, not only were there concerns about supplies, critical mineral, what we would now call critical mineral supplies from countries that might be hostile to the United States, like Japan and Germany and Italy, um, but also countries that would not normally be hostile, but would, um, because of the circumstances of war, their ability to provide us with um, uh, mineral commodities would be disrupted. Uh, this study identified seven uh, deficient strategic mineral commodities, antimony up through tungsten, I won't read them all. Um, this was a starting list when the war actually came along and, and uh, the country tried to deal with the strategic resources. This list grew quite long. Um, but they, they recommended implementing plans for two things, and they actually started on this. Of course, uh, this was one of the origins, there are many of the national defense stockpile, but the concept was that that would last about two years, because the First World War had lasted four years. You had no idea if there was another World War, how long that might last. And so they needed to, to be able to rely on mineral, 
alternative mineral sources for a fairly long period of time. They thought they could build up a national defense stockpile that could last for two years, and that there could also be what they called an underground stockpile, which would essentially be those known deposits or deposits that they could discover that with an intensive program of exploration and uh, study, um, these subcommercial deposits most likely lower grade but large volume so that they could produce significantly but were still subcommercial in the pre-war circumstances, they could be mapped and ready for production in, within two years. Now, um, even, even given the circumstances that one could consider in a national emergency, it's perhaps hard to think that we could discover and develop and put mines online within, within two years. Um, in the present day, but I, I, I wanted to ex want to explore a little bit this concept of alternatives to or supplemental aspects to a traditional stockpile. And here I've taken a couple of concepts from some of the wedges um, that Nadal showed earlier, where he talks about talked about possible elements of critical mineral strategy. And of course, at its fundamental level, that's a strategy to address our long-term challenge you know, to develop alternative sources, to reduce our requirements, um, to, uh, you know, improve recycling, et cetera, something that we're all working on, but will take a period of, of quite a few years. But also there's a lot of emphasis these days on potentially building up uh, what has historically been the national defense stockpile. Can we expand it? Can we build that stockpile up to something that could cover much larger part of the economy in the event of a significant uh, crisis and beyond immediate defense needs. And of course, that means uh, looking at the same elements of how we secure those critical mineral supplies, uh, whether through trade or increased primary or secondary uh, production. And uh, so then the question becomes, are there other ways in addition to simply buying or mining this stuff that we can diversify supply and be prepared for supply disruptions. Well, of course, the first question is, well, what do we have domestically in terms of critical mineral resources? And uh, uh, people at the USGS and other collaborators in the State Geological Surveys and elsewhere have been working very hard to start to pull this information together. And this, for example, is a recent uh, data uh, base that was released on our summary of everything we know about in the public domain of critical mineral deposits which have either been past producers, are current producers, or uh, and have defined resources, or their um, unmined deposits with defined resources. And so this includes all the critical minerals, whether they're primary co-products or byproducts. Um, and, and of course, this is a start where what we know, what could potentially be our uh, domestic critical mineral resource base. But of course, we have other ways of looking at where, uh, where one could find critical minerals and, and understanding why they're there. Uh, Nadal and others often show uh, what's on the right, this, this called wheel of companionability that uh, ties um, the tendency of certain uh, elements to associate with other elements, the ones in the center, of course, being common primary products and the ones around the wheel extending out from the center um, be more or less uh, associated with these primary products. And, and of course, within the, um, uh, the economic geology community and within the USGS, we're, we're focusing a lot on, on mineral systems and concepts that help us understand the geological processes that form and preserve these mineral deposits at all scales, and also begin to give us a, a geological and geochemical insights into why these um, uh, elements are associated the way they are and which ones will show up or should show up uh, in different deposits. And just here is an example from Porphyry Copper Molly system of uh, illustrating all the different deposit types um, uh, that could be associated with this mineral system and the principal commodities associated with those deposit types. And then of course in the right in the blue are the critical minerals that either are or could be or can be associated with those uh, deposit types. So as you pull this information together, you begin to say, oh, well, not only do we have um, 
uh, potential insight into if we go out to a known deposit that's a, a, a porphyry copper deposit, which is, of course, quite well known, or others, um, what might we find there in any particular deposit that's not so well studied? And, of course, a guide uh, to exploration on other deposits that might be associated with the known deposits and the critical minerals that could be developed as byproducts. Uh, and when you look at, at the data, and it all touched on this kind of globally with respect to tellurium and copper, um, you can begin to tease out uh, what, what things actually look like on the landscape. And this is a very detailed map. It's not easy to see, um, but uh, it illustrates um, uh, information on critical minerals that uh, Peter Vickery and his colleagues at the USGS compiled on subduction of related magmatic hydrothermal systems in the US where they pulled together uh, what we already had in the USGS, what was out in published databases, data sharing from industry, which we're very grateful for, and some new sample analyses, and indicate that out there on the landscape in uh, active mines, legacy mine waste, um, deposits we have relatively well characterized, and of course processing waste, um, uh, as Nadal mentioned, what's left in the anode slimes, that there could be decades to centuries uh, at the current rate of uh, consumption um, for uh, a whole slew of, of critical minerals, again, ranging from antimony all the way to, to tungsten. Now, of course, just because it's probably there or we know it's there uh, doesn't necessarily mean it's easy to get. And um, that gets back to uh, what folks have touched on already. Our focus, um, both within the USGS and through our partnerships in, with the states through the Earth Mapping Resources Initiative, to better understand what's out there in, in mine waste. So uh, unmined deposits, active mines, uh, legacy mines and their deposits, and of course uh, the legacy uh, and, and active uh, development of mine waste on the landscape. What's out there and uh, can we build it in an inventory so that these byproduct critical minerals, which often are byproducts, weren't produced in the past, maybe nobody knew about them, we can understand. The, the, the dots on the map represent uh, information from a national database from our U.S. Min project of mine features on the U.S. landscape, which of course remind us that mining historically has happened in every state and every part of the country. It's not just out in the western U.S. Um, but uh, you can sift through this because this is mine features. It could be anything from a, a pit to uh, at it to um, uh, a tailings pond, et cetera. If you sort this out, that's more than 700 data, thousand data points. You, you get it filtered down to about 14,000, which we know are, is not a complete um, uh, catalog of places where we can positively identify uh, mine waste storage features on the landscape. That's a lot of sites, and that's why it's so important to have the insight from the mineral deposit and mineral system studies, from the work that people are doing on individual deposits, to understand what might be where, how these sites correspond to different deposit types, because even with our, uh, our extremely talented state partners, we're not going to be sampling 14,000 mine sites. So we have to get a, a good idea from sampling ones that are most significant and most representative. Um, and as, as has been highlighted, we have industry examples, and it's tremendous that the industry has, has jumped into this, where, where whether it's the Bingham Canyon mine, I know Bob Seal and Nadine, uh, uh, Nadine's going to be, uh, Piatak's going to be talking later, have been working on separating tellurium and potentially other things from the active extraction uh, process. Rio Tinto was uh, looking at lithium production at their boron plant in California, and of course, here in, in Missouri, which is tied to the uh, uh, field trip later, um, uh, the site's recovering uh, uh, cobalt from, from mine waste and all. So, so we have examples and we can build on that. So back and just to, to wrap up, I think that when we think about a stockpile, when we think about investing efficiently, maybe not um, being able to afford a massive exploration program, although that would be great, um, uh, where can we uh, strategically invest uh, uh, government funds and look at uh, government policy? I think it's still worth considering, uh, you know, of course, in uh, doing what we can to discover deposits, develop new mines. But 
also um, diversifying the production in existing mines or have the technology and the equipment and the knowledge in place that if we need to do this on relatively short notice, we can start extracting those minerals, even if they might be sub-commercial now. Uh, secondly, we can consider reopening old mines. Uh, when the gallium and germanium export controls came on, people immediately thought of the Apex mine in Utah, which uh, produced gallium and germanium up until 1987. Um, is a mine like that reopenable? Can it be brought online? It's, it exists. Um, maybe there are fewer hurdles in many cases to getting something like that online, or you can, with modest investments, um, be prepared for reopening. And then, of course, uh, being prepared to produce the critical minerals from mine waste or producing them and increased rates of recycling, which I didn't have time to talk about here. But obviously, the partnerships across all forms of government and with industry and academia and the research development demonstration and the deployment, which is very key, are all essential here. And I'll stop there. Thank you.